Well, we are going to be talking about Ecclesiastes, Job, and Song of Solomon, but in this first message, it's going to be all introductory just to get us ready to look at Ecclesiastes in the second talk, Job in the third, and Song of Solomon in the fourth. Well, again, I'll give you my welcome to another four-part Saturday night Bible study. Now, if you've listened to my series on Jeremiah, then you probably have some understanding of how I go about wanting to hear God's voice, wanting to hear what he's saying to us in each of the books of the Bible. And in order to do that, I, I read what God is talking about with one, with one primary thought in my mind. And the primary thought is very simply this. I want to discern whatever questions God is choosing to answer in the book that he's inspired. What I don't want to do, what I think is a mistake to do, what I think is a dangerous mistake to do, is to come to this text, to come to Ecclesiastes, Job, Song of Solomon, Jeremiah, Leviticus, Joel, anything, all the books in the Bible. If we come to the Bible expecting that God is going to answer the questions that life is creating tension about in us, that we want answers to certain questions, so we open our Bible trying to find God's answers, trying to find God's answers, and, you know, things like this, just a couple of simple illustrations. God, how am I supposed to live with a husband who ignores me? Where do I turn for that? Well, I'll turn to, oh, maybe some verse in Ephesians. Maybe that'll give me some help. Or maybe another one that I certainly have familiarity with, and I'm sure many of you listeners have familiarity with this. I just got bad news from my doctor. And, and God, I'm feeling nervous. I'm scared. I don't know what you're up to, and I don't know what to do about that. Tell me how I can find peace in the middle of something which is really upsetting me. Well, the list goes on. Come to the Bible looking for answers to the questions that we're already asking of God. And what's going to happen more often than not, we're going to find the answers we think should be there, as opposed to discerning answers that God is actually giving us. The Bible can be so easily twisted if you come to it saying, here's my question, God, give me the answer that I'm going to like. And that's called eisegesis, putting into the text what you wish were there. But my approach, and I think every honest person who wants to read the Bible well and hear what God is saying, my approach is pretty simple. I want to read the Bible and discern what, what, is the, what are the questions? Is there a primary question or are there a series of questions that God is choosing to answer in the book that I'm reading, in the passage that I'm studying? And then that's called exegesis. I want to draw out of the text what I think God might be saying to me in the text. Well, that approach to a Bible study, I think is going to prove to be really quite important as in this series, I look at these three books in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, Job, Song of Solomon, because the way I'm understanding these books from a lot of study, the way I'm understanding this, these, these three books and the message that are in them is to realize that God is putting us on a journey that we don't want to take. And they call it the unlikely path to joy. But it's unlikely because the path that he's outlining in these three books really is a path that we're not terribly interested in taking. We'd rather have a different path. So as we now consider what God is saying to us in these three books, what I think I'm seeing as I've been reading them all and pondering them all and thinking about them for a long time in the past number of years, but now more particularly for this series, I think I'll come up with one question that I think God intends us to ask because this is the question that he's answering. And I think the, and the question that God wants us to be asking, because this is what he wants to answer, is this. Here's slide one. What do you suppose? What did God create us to most enjoy? God's a God of love. He's a God of joy. Um, and we need to ask that question. Well, God, if you're loving us and you want us to have joy, what did you create us to most, to most enjoy? Now, maybe there's a, a sub-question that follows. Well, what is the path that he designed for us to walk on that's going to bring us to whatever it is that we've been created to most enjoy? Well, let's kind of start at the beginning here. If we agree that God is love, the Bible declares that very basically, God is love. And if therefore he can never be anything other than loving, then we also must agree that whatever path he has ranged for us to travel on to the purpose he has for us is an expression of his loving desire to share the Trinity's joy with each of his children, with you and me. So let me start 
with this, what God created us to most enjoy in this life, and here's the difficult news to start with, what God created us to most enjoy in this life is not the blessings of life that we legitimately do enjoy. Such blessings as a good marriage, good kids, good friends, good ministry, good job, good money, all those are providentially arranged by God according to his decisions. Sometimes they're held back. But when the blessings are there, of course it's right to enjoy. But is there something not on the list that we were created to most enjoy? That's a question I want you to be thinking about with me. So if that is true, that what God is after is not finding, helping us to find joy in all the good blessings of life, the good things that we can legitimately enjoy, then we must not come to the Bible centrally to learn what we can do to arrange for all those good things that God does want us to experience joy. The Greek word, and this will get us into the direction that I wanted to take us, the Greek word that is most often translated joy in the New Testament is shara, C-H-A-R-A, chara, I presume it's pronounced. And that word actually, according to scholars that I read since I'm not one, but that word tells us three things, at least three things in this one word that is translated joy in the New Testament. Number one, the joy that God longs for us to experience does not come from life's blessings. Again, don't misunderstand me. It's right to feel happy when things go well. God's happy for that. But the shara, the, the chara, the real joy that God is looking for us to experience does not come from all the good things of life, life's blessings. That's point one. Point two, that this kind of joy, chara, remains alive in us when life is going bad for us in the middle of heartache, in the middle of catastrophe, in the middle of small little things, big things, that the joy that God gives us remains, whereas the joy that comes from blessings goes away when the blessings go away. Chara doesn't do that. Real joy doesn't do that. And three, and this is very clear from the scholars who know this word far better than I, of course, the third thing that the word char implies is that we were created to enjoy something that has its source entirely in the person of God, in the Trinity. Just our relationship with him is supposed to, is designed to provide us with chara, the real joy. Well, as we're about to see in Ecclesiastes, Job, and the Song of Songs, we call it the Song of Solomon and the like, but Song of Songs is the phrase I'm going to use mostly, the more clearly, as we look at these three books, the more clearly we're going to see what it is as Christian men and women that we most want to experience. And the more we look at these three books of the Bible, I'm convinced that the more we're going to recognize that the journey to joy, to chara, is a journey that none of us naturally wants to take. But why? Why would we have some resistance, some lack of appreciation for the journey that God is leading us on to joy that he thinks is the path to joy? And of course, he's right. So why don't we naturally respond to it? Well, well, I think there's a couple of reasons, maybe two in particular. First, we, we likely have not yet gotten in touch with our deepest joy, our deepest thirst that God longs to quench. Once we get a hold of that, once we understand what our deepest longing really is, the inconsolable longing, as Lewis puts it, once I understand my deepest thirst, then I'm going to realize that maybe it's going to take some, some, some real work to, to get to feeling the satisfaction of that deepest longing. That's point one. We've not gotten in touch with our deepest thirst. And two, as Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12, as of now, here's the quote, we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. That's how Paul put it. So let me very briefly summarize everything we're about to see in Ecclesiastes, Job, and the Song of Songs. We're going to get to slide two now. God is leading us to, to joy on a journey that moves us, number one, from the experience of boredom. He's going to lead us on a journey that takes us from the experience of boredom, through the experience of despair, into the experienced reality of love with a purpose. Now, we're going to look at that on the screen here for a minute. I want to make sure you get this. God is taking us on a journey from the experience of boredom. I don't really want to go there. Through the experience of despair. Is that necessary? Into the experience of love with purpose. Now, you know that the two key, key words in the two key words in Ecclesiastes. Um, 
one is a phrase, but the two words or phrase in Ecclesiastes that you're all familiar with. Number one is under the sun, and the other is vanity, the absence of anything worthwhile. So to preview what I'm going to be talking about in more detail, I want you to hear this. If, if you and I live under the sun, in other words, never taking into account the larger story that God is telling and just dealing with our smaller story, what's happening in my life right now that I can see, that I can feel, that I can experience. If all I'm thinking about is my story under the sun, if I'm living under the sun, I'm going to enter the Ecclesiastes experience, and that's the experience of boredom. That's the message of Ecclesiastes that I want to unpack. Now, we all know that um, the book of Job spends 38 of its 42 chapters describing one man's terrible suffering. So if we encounter ongoing, apparently meaningless suffering, which is what Job encountered, and is that not what all of us encounter at some degree, to some degree, at some level in our lives? If we encounter sometimes terrible, ongoing, apparently meaningless suffering, and if we feel the anguish of pain without purpose, that makes us wonder if God is indifferent to what's going on in our lives, that he seems so far away. And if you enter into this Job experience, then the experience that you're going to feel and become aware of in your own soul is despair. First boredom, then despair. And then the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs better known as the Song of Songs, because we're not totally sure Solomon wrote it, but it's all about his wisdom. That is pretty clear. And we realize that the Song of Songs is an allegory that, my understanding, reveals the love relationship initiated by our heavenly bridegroom with his bride, every Christian. And, and you taste, when you're in the Song of Songs, you understand we're being invited to taste, to savor the intimacy that's available between a human being and the divine person of God, the divine person of Jesus through his spirit. So if we can get out of Song of Songs, the idea of clinging to the hope that in God's nature of love, he's present in our worst seasons. And he's somehow using all the stuff we don't like going on in our lives, somebody is using it for our good. Then you're gonna be carried into the Song of Songs experience, which is the experience of joy, the experience of chara. So the journey to joy, a repeating cycle of the Ecclesiastes experience of boredom, moving toward the inevitable Job experience of despair that leads us into the song of song experience of love with the purpose until heaven always a joy that, ex that ex exists in the middle of continued trial and sorrow. And therefore, I want to call the joy that we're going to experience before heaven a, a painful joy because something is still going wrong. The joy continues, but there's pain in the process. Now that journey, and I wanna just explore this for a few minutes, that journey is seen all through the Bible. For example, Israel's wilderness journey through all difficult times, difficult place in order to get to Canaan, first the wilderness, then the promised land. Paul's encouragement to groan inwardly as we wait eagerly, that's in Romans 8, 23. And most remarkably, our Lord's journey through incredible disappointment and suffering, things that were hard for him in his entire life, particularly his three years of ministry, and obviously exquisitely in Gethsemane and on the cross, he went through incredible suffering that was required in God's understanding for our experience of joy. And through Isaiah, God assures us of his unbreakable, unbreakable relationship with us but then he goes on to say that that unbreakable relationship is nourished. It comes into reality in our souls. It's nourished through some huge stumbling blocks. Let me just mention to you a couple of verses in Isaiah chapter 43, a very familiar passage to many of us. In chapter 43, God begins by telling us, do not be afraid. I have called you and you are mine. Very personal, very relational. Don't be afraid, but why? Because I've called you, you belong to me, you are mine. But then after saying that in verses two and three, that's verse one in chapter 43, he anticipates rather clearly experiences that we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to endure some really tough times. Ecclesiastes Job comes to my mind, of course. We're gonna be experiencing things that are difficult to endure 
and they're going to tempt us to doubt his loving intentions toward us. Let me read you these three phrases that occur in Isaiah 43, verses 2 and 3. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. You're going to go through deep waters. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. Then he says, when you go through rivers of difficulty, you'll not drown. Well, why not just keep us out of the river of difficulty? That's not God's plan. And then thirdly, and this is maybe the worst of all, when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Well, I read those three declarations of going through deep waters, rivers of difficulty, fire of oppression, that I'm not going to, God's going to be with me during those times. I'm not going to drown in the water. I'm not going to get burned up in the, in the fire. I read those words, and the question that I suppose everybody's going to ask, I certainly do, God, must you allow us to go through all those trials? Is there any sense in which you would arrange for us to go, those through to go through all those trials? I don't want to go through them. Is this necessary? And even more, God, exactly where are you taking us? Why is this worth it? It's a very terrible price to pay. So I want to know what the reward is, if you will. That's kind of how I think. Maybe that's wrong, but that's how all of us, I believe, think about it. So with all that I've said so far, my wondering about all these kind of questions as I read Isaiah, as I read of Paul's difficult journey, as I realize the unmatched suffering that Jesus went through, without which none of us are ever going to experience the joy that God has for us. And as I reflect on my own struggles over 75 years of a life of life in this world, my wondering leads me to a cumbersome sentence. And this is the slide three. So let's get that slide up on the screen so I can look at it with you. Slide number three. It's a long, cumbersome sentence. So let me read it with you. I believe this is what's happening as we think about the Ecclesiastes Job Song of Songs experience. God is slowly changing us from, <clears throat> from Christians who, like me, too easily believe that there is nothing we want more than for our lives to be blessed with good things. He's changing us from Christians who believe that, because we all do to some degree, to Christians who want something more, something rich with meaning, something deeply satisfying, <clears throat> that we're going to be able to see is worth whatever price must be paid to enjoy what God has designed for us to enjoy. One more time through, God is slowly changing us from Christians who too easily believe that there's nothing we want more than for our lives to be blessed with good things, good family, good marriage, good health, good money, <clears throat> all the obvious good things of life in our smaller story, changing us from believing that to becoming Christians who want something more than all the good things of life, something that is eternally rich with meaning and deeply satisfying to the deepest part of our souls that is worth whatever price must be paid. <clears throat> now, forgive me for my little coughing thing here. Let me get a glass of water. <clears throat> the question I ask, why? God, why the high price? Couldn't you come up with a better plan? Why must we experience such, such deep satisfaction with life <clears throat> in this world that we're left with an intolerable sense of bored emptiness, often accompanied by aimless grief? This is the pathway to joy? I don't quite get that, God. And secondly, why must we experience painful fear and severe anguish, anguish that's so consuming that we have moments of despair? wondering if the God we long to trust, do you really love me? If you love me, I can't imagine you'd allow these things to happen to me. You want me to go through boredom with this life where all the good things of life that I do enjoy don't touch the deepest part of my soul and I end up realizing with Ecclesiastes, it's meaningless, it's vanity, there's no point to it. I'm getting what I really want is not available in the good things of life. I've got to go through that and I've got to go through despair where such struggles and difficulties that don't have any explanation, that I can't see any purpose in them, and I just feel left alone and in despair over, is life ever going to be anything good for me at all? And you, God, why do we have to go through that? <clears throat> well, as I was pondering that, my mind went to Jeremiah, <clears throat> back to Jeremiah, because in chapter 3, very difficult, interesting passage, not so difficult, but interesting, 
In chapter 3, we hear God rather plaintively, with some sadness, inviting his children. In verse 22, he says this, quote, Come back to me, and I will heal your wayward hearts. I wonder what coming back to him really means. Come back to me, because I'm the source of everything you deeply want. Come back to me. And I'm going to solve the problem that's keeping you from enjoying what I design you to enjoy. I'm going to heal your wayward hearts. And when God issued that invitation, come back to me, the people responded in the next verse, and these are the exact words, quote, yes, we're coming, for you are the Lord our God. Now just read that and you think, well, wonderful. This is going to move, move in a really wonderful direction. The children of Israel are responding to God's invitation. Yes, we are coming back to you, God. You're the Lord our God. We trust you with our entire existence. But that's not what's happening. They're really good words. And maybe like me, you've said similar words. I've sometimes in the middle of some hard times said, God, all I want is you. Come back. I want to come back to you. If I've been away from you, I want to come back with all my heart. But God as we all know, sees beneath whatever we're saying, even our good, holy-sounding words, and he sees into the condition of our hearts. And that's why in the next chapter, in chapter 4, God tells his people, in verse 6, I believe it is, quote, plow up the hard ground of your heart. You want joy? You want to experience what God created us to enjoy? Well, there's something you got to do. You got to plow up the hard ground in your heart. I got to plow up the hard ground in my heart. What's that all about? Well, think of the hard ground of the heart that God sees, but we don't really see and don't many times even recognize is there. Think of that, think of the hard heartedness, the hard ground in our heart as our greatest internal enemy of holiness. The Bible calls it New Testament, the flesh. I visualize the flesh what J.I. Packer calls the anti-God virus, that's so much more deadly than the coronavirus, deadly to our souls. I visualize the flesh as a thick crust wrapped around our new hearts. God's been giving us a new heart. Jeremiah told us that. Ezekiel tells us that. God gave us a new heart. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. I have a new heart. But around that heart, there's a thick crust that's been wrapped around my heart that doesn't allow penetration into the deepest part of my soul, the deepest part of my being. Its thickness, and here's the real tragedy of this thick crust, its thickness prevents us from discovering the thirst in our redeemed heart, the thirst to know God. Once discovered and felt with spiritually alive intensity, then something really important happens, we begin to realize that no price is too high to pay in order to experience what we were created to enjoy. God, I'm thirsty for something, and what I really want, only you can provide, and you're telling me I've got to go through the boredom of Ecclesiastes, the despair of uh, Job. I don't want to go through that. I don't want to go through deep waters and rivers of difficulty and, fi and, and oppression of a fire. I don't want to go through any of that, but this is what you're going to call me to? I'm really not terribly interested in that until I realize what my thirst most deeply is. So what I'm suggesting as we get into these three books of the Bible, I'm suggesting that the boredom of the Ecclesiastes experience pokes holes in that crust. That boredom convinces us that living on the surface of the crust means to live in vanity. All the good things of life don't satisfy the deepest part of my soul. It's that boredom that pokes a hole in the crust and gives the spirit deeper access into who we really are in the core of our being. We want to go deeper. We want to understand. In the middle of boredom, we want to find something that's not boring, that's zealous, that's alive, that's real, that's hopeful, that feels meaningful and powerful and is summarized with the word chara. Our desire for more pokes the hole. And the despair of the Job experience creates a, a desperation. God, are you there in the middle of all this? A desperation to know God that widens the soul. Now, if you heard all that, I want to put up slide four now. If you heard all that, you're going to understand that there's a, a major point that's being made by these two 
uh, books so far, as we're just over uh, looking at them in a very broad way at the moment. Here's what I want you to hear. Until monotonous boredom and hopeless despair cracks the crust that keeps us unaware of our passionate thirst for nothing less than God himself, we will not enter into the unshakable reality of the peace and joy, the ability to love that only divine love can generate. You understand that? Monotonous boredom, hopeless despair cracks the crust so we can then we can then enter into the reality of the Song of Songs experience of joy that only divine love can generate. But let me tell you, in order to illustrate, what I believe is a, a really powerful illustration of what I've just, um, just read to you on the slide. Let me tell you a true story that you may not have heard that illustrates how boredom and despair opens the soul to an experience of God. It's about a man that all of us know his name, Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic doctor of the church, he was called, very brilliant man, very leading, influential doctor of the church. And he was born a long time ago in 1225, and he died in 1274. He was 49 years old when he died. And during those 49 years, he wrote a bunch of books. The most famous one is called the Summa Theologia. It took him nine years to write this extensive treatment of all the heights of theology. I want you to understand the truth that God has revealed in the scriptures, and I'm going to take nine years to write this out in detail, and he did. But here's the first part of the story. I have two parts to the story. After nine years of writing this huge, massive work that still exists today, and people still read it, it's really, really quite a book. I've not read the whole thing. I've looked at parts of it. But after putting his pen down, after nine years of writing this, he turned to a friend, and he somewhat tersely said, I will write no more books. Why? Well, his friend Reginald was taken aback, and he asked, why? Thomas, you've still got your mind about you. You're not really that old of a man. You're 47, 48, whatever you are at this point, and you got so much more in you. Why don't you want to, isn't there more that you want to write about? And this was his answer. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's very close to what Thomas said to his friend after he was asked to explain why he wouldn't write anymore. He, he said this, all I have written is mere straw. All I have written is mere straw compared to the experience of knowing Christ. In other words, all the recognition that he got, all the enjoyment of using his brilliant mind to write this incredible book, all the recognition, all the applause that he got, all the importance that it helped him feel, all those things which have legitimacy to them, he's saying, those things don't count. It's the Apostle Paul saying that all that I have, a Pharisee of the Pharisee, and all the things that he talked about in terms of his knowledge before he became a Christian, he said, I count them all as dung. That was his word compared to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what Thomas is saying. Well, um, I wonder, as I think about that, I wonder if his boredom with what he could do led to a despair of ever experiencing what his soul most longed for. And as a result, he didn't really want to write more books. He wanted to, how do I put it simply, spend time with God, just to pursue his relationship with God. Well, the story continues. And here's the second part. I think it's the best part. Bored and despairing, one day near the end of his life, Thomas was in the chapel and he was kneeling and praying before the altar. He thought he was alone, but there was a man named Reginald, a friend, who had followed him into the chapel. Thomas was unaware that he was following him in, and Reginald stood behind in the chapel, watching and observing as Thomas was kneeling and praying before the altar. And something happened, very mystical. Something happened that when asked about it later, when Reginald re reported what happened, Thomas didn't talk about it, but Reginald did, and when people said, are you serious, did that actually happen? Under oath, Reginald swore that this is exactly what he saw and what he heard. As Thomas was kneeling and praying silently, a voice came from the mouth of Christ on the crucifix and asked a question. The voice said this, you have written well of me, Thomas. What will you have as a reward? Now just ponder that as slide number five comes on the screen. 
ponder that. What will you have? Listen to what he said. Only yourself, Lord. Now just look at that just for a second. You can have anything you want from God. He's offering it to you. I want nothing but you. Only yourself, Lord. Do, do you resonate with that? Do I resonate? With all else that I want, if God came to me and said, you can have anything you want, Larry. I've been pleased with your service to me all these years. Tell me what you want. Well, I think a couple of things come to my mind. My, my health isn't always the best. I wouldn't mind really good health in my senior years. I wouldn't mind feeling really good and full of energy until the day that I die in 10 years, 15 years, two months, whenever. God, I'd kind of like to finish really well with health and energy and passion and ongoing ministry. That's what I'd like, God. It's not what Thomas said. Is that how I'd respond? Would I say only yourself, Lord? Huh. If not, well, why not? Have I not understood Ecclesiastes? Have I not understood um, Job and the value of going through the Job experience? And notice, too, that Jesus asked, asked the same question. The story is told in the first chapter of John's Gospel. Um, the ministry of Jesus was just getting started. He was just beginning his public ministry of three years. And we're told in the very beginning of the story that at one point he was walking past John the Baptist. And John had two of his disciples with him. And as Jesus walked past, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he, he called out. And he said, um, look, that's the Lamb of God. There is the Lamb of God. That's what he said. And these two disciples, their curiosity was aroused. That's the Lamb of God. That's a big phrase you're talking about. We're Jews. We know something about the Lamb that was sacrificed in the Old Testament. Now, he's the Lamb of God. And the Bible tells us they began following Jesus. Now, Jesus, aware of all things, at one point he turned around, saw these two guys, and he asked the question, what do you want? Same question that Christ asked Thomas Aquinas according to Reginald. And I guess I wonder if there's a more important question that Jesus is asking me. Now, apparently the two disciples of John somehow sensed that whatever it was they most wanted, when Jesus said, what, what do you guys want? You're following me. What do you want? Those were his exact words in the Gospel of John. They were somehow sensing, I would suggest, because they were following him, that they wanted something that Jesus could provide, but they didn't know what it was. They weren't aware of their deepest thirst. So they replied, Rabbi, why do they call him Rabbi? Well, Rabbi means teacher. So they were assuming, I think you have something to teach us, Rabbi. Therefore, we'd like to ask you a question, Jesus. Where are you staying? In other words, we want to pursue you. We want to follow you. We want to get to know you. We want to hear what you have to offer us. Now, when they said, um, where are you staying? I envision with my imagination that Jesus, uh, somewhat seriously but meaningfully smiling, as he said, come and see. I think what he's saying, and then these two men had no idea what they were in for. A journey through life with many trials and sorrows, a price to pay to follow Jesus on the narrow road, but a price that would put them in touch with what they were created to most enjoy and they would live with the hope of its reality meaningfully tasted now, fully tasted forever in heaven. And they spent, they, 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 this whole began at four o'clock in the afternoon, the whole thing began at four in the afternoon when Jesus turned and said, Where are you, what are you wanting? And they followed Jesus, and Jesus said, come and see. So they followed him, and they were with him for the rest of the afternoon and on into the evening, we're told that. And one of the two disciples was a man named Andrew, one of the disciples of Jesus eventually. This was his beginning of discipleship. He was the brother of Simon, who we know better as Peter. And after those several hours of chatting with Jesus, can you imagine chatting with Jesus? He hurried to find his brother Simon and listen to what he said. As soon as he saw Peter, as soon as he saw Simon, he said, we have found the Messiah. Now, to say the least for a Jew, that was a big deal. Think about it. After years of Jewish rituals, centuries of rituals, that were just that, rituals that provided no real sense of life. Andrew had to be bored with religion, as a lot of us are today. And if it's just religion, we ought to be bored. And after years of, of oppression from one nation after another, beginning in, with Egypt, back in the days of Moses, up to the days of Rome now, where Andrew was living at the time, all this, all this time of being oppressed by other nations, Israel wasn't free. 
And now Andrew, no doubt despairing over the freedom that he wanted but couldn't experience, he began to realize, no, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that's going to come and make things right. He's the one that's going to come and touch what is deeply going on inside of us. And I would suggest that Andrew was then waking up to what he most wanted, somehow aware that it was available only in Jesus. We want to see. And when they came and spent time with Jesus, this is the Messiah. We found him. So the question, what do you want? The answer, we found him. Well, the story of Aquinas and now of Andrew reveals an important truth that is, I have written out on slide number six. An important truth that as I ponder the story of Aquinas and the story that we just talked about from John, see if this strikes you a little bit. No Christian today moves towards satisfying maturity without becoming aware of a thirst within him stronger than any other thirst for what only Jesus provides. No Christian, me, you, no Christian today moves towards satisfying maturity, what we really long to become, mature, little Christ, without becoming aware of a thirst stronger than any other thirst. And we have plenty of other thirsts for what only Jesus provides. Now, one more illustration to illustrate that particular point. This from Jesus yet again. Standing up to speak loudly to a large group of religious people, you know the story in John 7, he wanted to be heard, and so the Bible tells us he shouted to what was apparently a large group of people that were going through one of the Jewish rituals, and what he said was this, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Now what I hear him asking in that particular comment to those religious people, I hear him in that statement asking me a question today. What do you really want? Have you realized something is missing in all that you have? Are you thirsty for something more, something even better than a really good marriage? Are you thirsty for more than good health? Are you thirsty for kind of joy your, fresh, your best friend can't, can't deliver? And are you thirsty for something more satisfying than a well-received ministry, a great job, and plenty of money? Are, are you thirsty for this or have you gotten so satisfied with lesser thirsts that have been reasonably quenched that you're asking for nothing more. If so, you're in danger. And if so, I'm in danger of never coming to an understanding of what I was created to most enjoy. I don't misunderstand me. God is saying very clearly, enjoy all the blessings. Enjoy all the blessings that I, God, providentially provide. When you have a good marriage, of course enjoy it. When you have a good dinner, of course enjoy it. But realize you were created to enjoy what none of those blessings can offer. So I hear Jesus telling us, slide number seven, I hear Jesus telling us something that is really uh, a little hard to hear. But this is what I believe Jesus is saying to us in that passage in John chapter seven. Don't come to me with only those lesser thirsts. And again, don't misunderstand. Yes, come to him with our lesser thirsts. God, I want to be healthy. I want the I, I want the, the surgery to go well. I, I, I want my marriage to really be good. I want my kids to turn out well. Sure, of course, come to him with that. But don't come to him with only those le lesser thirst. Why? Jesus speaking, because I don't promise to quench them. What I want you to do is to come to me with the thirst that I created in you in order to fully and eternally quench. That's what I want you to come to me with, your deepest thirst. Well, that's most of what I have to say, but I want to say one more thing. So I'll put up with a little, little couple of more minutes. One final thought, and it comes from an atheist philosopher, a German man named Martin Heidegger, who, did all, who, who, who died about 50 years ago, a rather recent philosopher. And he began one of his books with a kind of questions only philosophers who love to explore the unexplorable tend to ask. And his question was this, slide number eight. This is a question that began his book. Why is there anything rather than nothing? Martin Heidegger. Why is there anything rather than nothing? How long have you been puzzling over that question? If you're like me, not much. Invite your small group to wrestle with that question, and your small group will likely get smaller. But state the question differently, and I think more than a few might stick around. Think of it this way. Same question, but put a little differently. 
Do you ever wonder why you should bother to do anything? Or maybe is life making no real sense to you at all? The coronavirus, with experts offering conflicting advice, does that make any sense? Your best friend's really lousy marriage, even though both husband and wife are sincere believers, does that make any sense? Your daughter's life-threatening illness, if that's your situation, does that make any sense? All the narcissism you see in yourself and in your church, does that make any sense? Can you make sense out of all that you see in life? Why is there anything rather than nothing? Put it in those terms, and maybe we let that question strike a little more closely to home. And then listen to what Heidegger said about that question. This is a quote from his book. I quote, Many men, the old-fashioned way of referring to men and women, many men never encounter the question. If by encounter, these are Heidegger's words, if by encounter we mean not merely to hear and read about it as an interrogative question, but to ask the question, that is, to bring it about, to raise it, to feel its inevitability. Well, what I'm suggesting as I wrap up this first talk is it's not a bad question to get in the back of your mind as we begin to explore Ecclesiastes, Job, and Song of Solomon. Why is there anything rather than nothing? God made everything, so why is it all here? What's the point of existence? And actually, Heidegger goes on, I'm not going to quote it further, but he goes on to say something really interesting to me, that the question, and this is what Heidegger actually says, this question, why is there anything rather than nothing, it comes to mind when life is disappointing. He's referring to the Ecclesiastes experience. Sometimes, he says, it comes to mind when we suffer with no relief available. I think he's talking about the Job experience. But then he adds at the end of this paragraph, this question sometimes get asked, gets asked when life is going well, but we're strangely aware that something we dearly want is missing. The Song of Songs experience, where we come to realize that there really is a thirst that God intends to forever satisfy. <clears throat> so, as I close this introduction to the message God has for us in Ecclesiastes, Job, and the Song of, Song, uh, Song of Songs, I bring up Heider's question one last time. Why is there anything rather than nothing? In Ecclesiastes, Solomon told us what it was like to live under the sun. He found nothing that gave him what he most wanted in all that is available as we live in the smaller story of our lives. Ecclesiastes asks the question that the rest of the Bible answers. Maybe there really is something to hope for and in measure to, en and, and in measure to enjoy from which I can draw real strength when nothing less satisfies. And maybe when nothing makes sense, maybe I can find some strength in what Ecclesiastes is leading me toward. Maybe there really is something to gladly live for when big dreams shatter and life gets turned upside down. That's my introduction to a series that we're gonna see, <clears throat> we're gonna to come to see that it really is all about spiritual formation, the pathway to our joy becoming who we were created to be, who we most long to be, if we're aware of our deepest thirst. Maybe we're now ready with this introduction to more deeply explore the journey the Spirit is leading us on from the experience of boredom, through the experience of despair, into the experience of love with a purpose that really matters. And the last slide, let you know what's coming up in my next message. Very simply, next week, the Ecclesiastes Experience. That's what we're going to be talking about next week, the Ecclesiastes Experience. That's my introduction. Looking forward to sharing with you next week. Thanks for listening.